you come to prayer with me this morning? All embracing and loving God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for bringing us into our neighborhood. And I ask that you open our hearts and open our minds that we may be receptors of the word that is to be spoken for you. But that we take and mold our minds and through the words that we go, I ask that you would touch my lips of clay and mold them into the words that are spoken on this day. And they come from my mouth and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts. May this ever be acceptable to you. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. So I invite you to take a look at the monitors this morning. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, would you be mine? Be mine, won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please, won't you be my neighbor? So I'm sorry to say that coming from California, I don't quite have the fall sweaters or winter sweaters, so I don't own a cardigan. Otherwise, I probably would have worn that this morning and uh, made it a little bit more family and personal. But this morning we start a new sermon series, as you can probably see, The Gospel According to Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. <laughs> as the worship team and I were coming up with ideas, we wanted to make this next sermon series something a little bit different. Several ideas and themes came to the table as we were discussing this. But for some reason, as we were looking at the resources that I put on the table that evening, one book out of my library kept surfacing to the top of the list. And that book was written by Fred Rogers. Now keep in mind, the pastor made a major faux pas on Friday when I wrote my message in the weekly that when I was giving my introduction of Fred Rogers, I accidentally transposed Fred into Frank Rogers. <laughs> and for a very good reason. You need to understand that there was a Fred and a Frank Rogers, who were role models in my life, at various stages of my life. Frank Rogers, who is also an ordained minister, just happened to be one of my seminary professors. And Fred Rogers, well, he too, an ordained minister, would somehow catch my attention every afternoon like clockwork. For over 30 years, every afternoon, Excuse me. Fred Rogers would start his television show by singing It's a Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. Fred Rogers originated this show back in 1963 as Mr. Rogers on the CBC network, which actually is the Christian broadcast channel. And it was later rebranded in 1966, and I was still a young boy, and I won't go how far, how old I was, mm -hmm. as Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And it was aired on a regional network, later made its US debut through all of the United States in February of 1968. This show nearly ran for four decades. Wow. Now, some of you may not be four decades, some of us may be a little bit beyond four decades this morning, but this show ran nearly four decades and ended in August of 2001. This show, when it was created, was primarily for preschoolers, two to five, but it was deemed appropriate for all ages, so it encompasses all of us, by PBS back in the day. And the iconic song and its beautiful it's iconic song, It's a Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, 
along with all the characters in the neighborhood, have been engraved in a lot of our heads, from the baby boomer generation to the Gen X generation, to many this day with the reruns on PBS. But what I'm sure many of you don't realize that Mr. Rogers not only produced a 30-minute television show each afternoon, but he also wrote poetry and he also wrote many of the songs that were used in the show over the 30 years. If you take a moment and go back and actually watch, <laughs> if you go back and listen to each of Mr. Rogers' episodes very carefully, you will discover that Fred Rogers would explicitly describe almost every motion and action that was happening throughout the show. This was done because a blind child wrote him shortly after the show started. <coughs> Excuse me. A uh, blind child wrote him shortly after the year started and became a fan by just listening to that 30 minutes every afternoon. So what Mr. Rogers did is to include all the children in the neighborhood, he would explicitly describe what was happening, or for the most, describe what was happening in the show. So these children, who were not visually able to see what was going on in that neighborhood, could hear and be a part, just like every other child, to be engaged in the neighborhood that transformed each and every one of them every afternoon for that 30 minutes. So I said earlier that Fred Rogers only didn't have that talent of doing that show, but he had a talent of poetry and creating many of those characters that we remember for the sh from the show, as well as writing a lot of that music. Did you know that there is actually an album? Now, again, I'm dating myself because now we have CDs and DVDs, but back when there was actually real records on vinyl, there was a record made, the 25 greatest hitch, hits of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. So as we were compiling this series, we went through and looked at all the 25 titles that were on um, this album. And of course, you know, with modern technology, they're on the internet. And it gives us all the words. So we kind of went through and went through this and picked out what we felt might be some of the lessons that we could take in conjunction with scripture and bring you the gospel according to Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. In my opinion, the parable of the Good Samaritan also relates to that opening song, Won't You Be My Neighbor? It's one of the most endearing ways that we can't even fathom or imagine that comes to life. Only in the Gospel of Luke, the word Samaritan has managed to work its way into our vernacular. We hear it as Samaritan hospitals or the Good Samaritan laws that protects people like EMTs and doctors and people in the medical field. Good thing to go back. Google Samaritan and see what comes up and see, see all of the different definitions. I did that the other day and I was quite astounded by where Samaritan fits into the vernacular of our world. But you see this parable was a way that Jesus was being tested by the authorities and the lawyers of that time being asked what must we do to inherit eternal life? And it was quite obvious, of course, to Jesus, and Jesus knew the answer. The lawyers and authorities even knew the answer, that this was written law, love God and love your neighbor. A simple gesture and thought, one might think. However, we also know that love your neighbor, sometimes that scenario could be a bit fuzzy, especially in that period of time. It was really too hard for someone to wrap their heads around what being a good neighbor was. We're also reminded in other areas of the early scriptures in the Old Testament to love your God, God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. As we heard that being brought to us, several weeks ago when we were in the B-series. And to love your neighbor as yourself, both coming from the Old Testament scripture. 
However, this lawyer who was questioning Jesus was trying to get a definition of neighbor. Who really is my neighbor? After all, it can also imply that some are actually not our neighbors. In ancient time, Jewish teachers very frequently used the word neighbor to simply mean the, excuse me, fellow Israelites. I'm going to get that word out for a moment. Jesus might have simply just given the lawyer a legal definition of the term neighbor, but he didn't. He might have even delineated all the characters that make a person a true neighbor and described the things that disqualified one from the neighborly status. But yet, you hear Jesus tell a story, a story that is one to one known to many if you go through the New Testament. The story has a man heading down from Jerusalem to Jericho, as you heard in scripture this morning. And on this route was, a well, was well known for the identity for all kinds of robbers and evildoers. See, at that time, Jericho was not considered a safe place. It was where a lot of the riffraff would hide out. It was on a be that beaten path that he was beaten senseless, senseless by the robbers, excuse me, who took everything, including his clothes, and left him to die. So along comes a minister, I would say a good pastor of the local MCC church, who sees the man lying dead on the road. And yet that pastor passes on by. Some might have speculated that that good pastor wasn't sure if the man was even dead or not, and didn't even want to take that chance to cross back over, but yet didn't want to run against the law because in that time there was this law of ceremonial uncleanliness by touching a dead body. And people of that faith or of the clergy, it was an uncleanly thing for them to do, was to touch things that were unclean or a dead body that was lying there. So they would pass it by. The next person who came along was one of the lay leaders of the church, as I always put it, who also passes on the other side of the road. Because this person was a Levite. And well, they were not strict, but they also were the type that would avoid defilement. Keep in mind that every minister in that period of time was a Levite, but not every Levite was a minister. So what was driving these two individuals to stray away and not get involved in this messy situation? Were they too afraid that they would be robbed themselves? Do you think that this man who was lying there half dead was a trap? Because that happened in that time. In my opinion, I think is what we call in today's world and society, I can't get involved reflex. I don't want to get involved reflex. Oh no, let somebody else take care of it. So now in our story, there's a third individual. Jesus, the good Jew, said the man was a Samaritan. If Jesus and his audience had been from UWM up the street, he might have said that the man was just simply a UWM, a UWM alumni just lying in the street. And for college towns, that's not too uncommon sometimes when you are having a great Friday night or a great Saturday night that we get a little too happy and we kind of stray off. I can attest to a group of us last night, or yesterday, we were having a great time. I had my first experience of going to the Baby Bash. Saw lots of interesting things. And then last night I was actually very honored and privileged to um, be able to uh, bless rings for a couple that I know for their engagement. But, you know, when you get a group of 20 or so gay people together, you have a good time. And I was just say, being the designated driver, it was a very interesting ride home last night. And I'll just leave it at that. But 
back in that period of time, there was no love lost between the Jews and the Samaritans. But still, violence between them would have been the exception and not the rule. See, to a Jew, the Samaritans would have been considered the bad guys, or until in today's culture, the gangsters of the hood across town. This was a person that anyone in time would ever expect to be an exemplary neighbor. Who would be doing that right thing? But that Samaritan went those extra six steps, took those steps, and took those actions that were the following. Went up to the individual. Bandaged the individual's wounds. Anointed that individual with oil and wine, for in that time, that was considered medical washing and disinfectant, believe it or not. You know, always good alcohol, always, good, always a good disinfectant, you know, kills anything, you know. So they use, they use the wine as disinfectant. But then picks up that individual and loads him on a mule. And then takes him to the local Conrad Hilton up the street. And lastly, gives the innkeeper and promises him that by giving the money that he will take good care of this individual. And number six implies to probably a lot of common practice that the Good Samaritan was guaranteeing that when he got to the Hilton, that he was making sure that the individual was taken care of for, at least in that time, about a three and a half to four week period. So a few pieces of silver or gold went a long way in that day. So it was that assurance that he was making sure that that person was being taken care of. At the same time, he was also taking the risk of endangering himself, again, not knowing what was going through the roads of Jericho. So who is our neighbor or neighbors? I think we really just have to look all around us. We're all one another's neighbors. As it relates to this congregation, we have many neighbors in the neighborhood. Aside from being neighborly with our own congregation, it starts as we extend ourselves out into our own MCC network with our network churches. Our churches in Illinois, our churches in Minneapolis, in that area, so my geography is still a little bit off being um, in the Midwest, but all of our sister churches are our neighbors. And as we look at our, at our community partners, our inner church faith partners are part of our family, part of our neighborhood. Monday night, if a lot of you were not aware, we hosted the very first uh, interfaith queer and allied group of clergy from Milwaukee. This is the first time that this group has been formed, I think, ever. And 15 members of the faith community from different faith and faith organizations throughout town came together and sat around a table right here. We had the Baptists, we had the Lutherans, we had the Episcopalians, we had the Unitarian Universalists, we had MCC and we had UCC, but 15 of us sat around a table and were neighborly to one another. The result of that meeting was how do we become the neighbor in the community? How do we work as neighbors in the community to build a stronger community. And I have to say, I was quite touched by what, we, what I saw. Seeing people come together, you know, and getting clergy out on a Monday night, especially after a Sunday, is not the most easiest thing to do, but got together and had these discussions. How do we become neighbors to our other partners in the community? And a lot of our other partners in the community, such as the Center, ARCW, Cream City Foundation, Milwaukee Pride, and that list goes on and on, are our neighbors. But we're also their neighbors. But this morning, I want to just focus a moment on one of the newest members in our neighborhood and in the life of this church. And that's Courage Milwaukee. I'm very proud to say that we have partnered up as neighbors with Courage Milwaukee. And for those of you who don't know about Courage Milwaukee, let me just share for a moment. Courage Milwaukee is an organization that started just roughly over two years ago here in town. 
somewhat like Pathfinders, if you're familiar with that, has some of the qualities of Project Q from the center, but it reaches a bit further into the LGBTQI, and as I call it, the, the alphabet down the line, but it reaches out into that world of homeless youth. Our neighbor reaches outside of that box primarily to the homeless LGBT community, but also reaches out to all homeless youth in Milwaukee. Our youth need that neighbor to help them pick them off that street and to love and care for them. Just like we do as good Christians being a part of this community, we take care of our own, but part of our own are those kids. This morning and for the next six or so weeks, we have launched what we are calling our Courage Winter Madness Clothing Drive. That kind of sounds like the winter white sale or the Whitman Madness sale as you go out to Macy's or something, but we are, we are bringing that opportunity for us to extend our neighborly gifts to the young LGBT youth of Milwaukee, especially when winter comes. So what we're gonna be doing is that we're gonna be collecting athletic socks, gloves, hats, whatever, all that winter gear. We can go as far as coats, but we, we kind of centralize the list to just the, the basics. But realize that almost 80% or more of the time, those kids are walking the streets with holes in their socks, nothing to keep them warm, and they're not being treated as our neighbor. So I want us to be that neighbor over the next six weeks, but even beyond. I want us to start bringing the socks and the gloves and all that, and if you wish, like we did with the school supply drive, you can indicate on your offering envelope that you are giving for the Courage campaign or the clothing drive, and we will then make the monetary donation to, to Courage at the end of that. This drive will go all the way to the end of October, which actually is All Saints Sunday, and as we get closer, you'll hear more about that. But it's also the Sunday before their major fundraiser. And I was very, very honored to have a lovely conversation with their uh, director over the weekend. And the gifts that they give to the community are so valuable. And during this conversation, I had asked, so how do we be neighborly? How do we support your event? How do we get tickets to your event? And the response was, oh no, you're our guest. You come as our guest and you bring your partner or plus one. And as the conversation grew even further, it was, I want you to bring your entire board. That was the gift of being neighborly. There was no solicitation or whatever. It was, come be our neighbor. Come join with us and celebrate what we're doing and what we're doing to bring these kids to a safer environment. And if you want to go beyond that and be neighborly with these kids, I can tell you there's a lot of opportunities coming up. As we partner with Courage and we become their neighbor and become their partner, there are going to be plenty of opportunities as they start growing and building on the northwest side of Milwaukee. They are in the process of building a facility for these kids to come off the streets. But it's also where there's a drop-in center where they're looking for people to come mentor the kids, come talk with the kids, help these kids get their GEDs. There's lots of opportunities, so if you're interested, see me, and I'll get, you, I'll get you connected. But Jesus tells the parable not to answer the question of who is my neighbor, but rather ask the question, to whom can I be the neighbor? How can I be the neighbor to those? Jesus isn't setting any limitations on the obligations of loving your neighbor, but yet, how can we help someone in any situation who is in need? And how to be like that Samaritan did. Not just feeling sorry for the person or group, but bringing that to a different perspective. The man in the story, after all, was traveling, you know, in a dangerous road. But one who loved God wholly and fully and had a relationship with God. So when Jesus asked the question at the end of the parable that we heard this morning, so which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the individual who fell into the hands of the robber? 
Was it the kind-hearted MCC pastor? Was it the kind lay person of the church? Or was it the Samaritan? The reply was, the one who had mercy on an individual, knowing that the entire time it was the Samaritan who helped. So who's your neighbor? Better yet, who do you think isn't your neighbor? And beyond that, who are you going to reach out and help? Who is a Samaritan in your life? And who do I be that neighbor to as I go forward each and every day in my life? As Fred Rogers reminded us so many, for so many years in the past, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Please, won't you be my neighbor? And God's love and blessing. Amen. Amen.